First of all, I want to thank each and every single one of you that are here today. 150 plus people have come out in uh, support of this press conference, so thank you so much for being here. Um, like Avery said, my name is Terry Pickens Manweiler, and I'm the Democratic candidate for Idaho Lieutenant Governor. Today is a very somber day, a frightening day. Today, the United States Supreme Court rolled back the clock 50 years. 50 years. Women and pregnant people no longer have the protection of the fundamental right affirmed to them in 1973 with the decision in Roe versus Wade. The fundamental right to bodily autonomy, the freedom to make intimate and personal choices that are the center of personal dignity, a freedom I have known my entire life. The U.S. Supreme Court's decision today to revoke a woman's right to medical choices, in this case to choose to have an abortion, erodes the freedom of every Idahoan and every American. First, I want to say the Idaho Democratic Party stands with the women and pregnant people in this state that are scared, that are confused, and that they don't know what to do. Let me be clear. Let me be clear, today, you still have the right to legal access to abortion services. If you need reproductive health care, it is still a protected right in Idaho. Please seek the care if you need it. It will not be deprived of you for now. In 30 short days, that won't be the case. We have to protect and exercise the choices we still have. Today, Republican politicians have taken away our choice to make personal medical decisions, in this case, the right to an abortion. But women still have a very powerful choice today. Vote. Yes. yes. A strong majority of Americans, 62% oppose the monumental decision to roll back that right for women to have a right to choose. This move from the Supreme Court is stacked with, stacked with extreme Republicans appointees demonstrates a view of freedom that Americans don't share. It's not the view of the American people. In our state, the GOP supermajority has already passed two horrific anti-abortion laws. Senate Bill 1365 passed in 2020, signed by Governor Little. It criminalizes abortion 30 days after the decision in Roe versus Wade, which is today. The clock starts today. We have 30 days left of bodily autonomy. But the insult does not stop there. This year, the extremist supermajority also passed Senate Bill 1309, criminalizing abortion to medical providers and also putting a bounty on those medical providers' heads for $20,000. The Texas-style abortion bill allows families of rapists to sue medical providers if the victim seeks or obtains abortion care in Idaho. Idaho, it's time to wake up. I'm officially sounding the alarm. It is painful and frightening to know that my daughter has less freedom growing up here than I did. Idaho has targeted her freedom, and it's not the first time. This happened in 1990. Idaho then passed the most extreme anti-abortion law in the country. Then Governor Cecil Andrus rightly vetoed that legislation. With the entire country watching, then Governor Cecil Andrus vetoed that legislation knowing that that could end his reelection. But it didn't. Guess what? Idaho women showed up. In fact, that year, Governor Andrus was reelected by a wider margin than before, and Democrats made strong strides in taking back control in the House and Senate.
In 1990, Idaho women, regardless of political affiliation, voted for candidates who respected them and who pledged to preserve and protect their fundamental rights. The same thing is going to happen this year yeah. in Idaho and across the country. If we don't stand up to this attack, what personal freedom will we lose next? The right to access birth control? Yeah. Yeah. Representative Crane has already said IUDs and Plan B are on the table. And what about our LGBTQ plus community? Will they still have the fundamental right to marry who they love? No. And what about interracial marriage? Is that on the line? And finally, how about interstate travel? Are women going to be prevented to cross the state line because they're seeking medical care? Where will it stop? The time is now for every single Idahoan to stand up and say enough is enough. Our freedoms are not at your disposal. I have a message to the Idaho GOP supermajority and I want it to be perfectly understood in no uncertain terms. We won't go back. I'm going to turn it now over to Representative Alana Rebell. Thank you. Thank you all so very much for coming out here today on this um, very sad day, but made somewhat less sad by this powerful demonstration of so many people who value women's freedom and autonomy. Um, as Terry Pickens-Manweiler put it so well, today's decision has undone the constitutional right to privacy under the 9th and 14th Amendments of the Constitution. This right, to be clear, has been the foundation for 50 years of protection from state legislators who want to control every aspect of our private lives, every aspect, not just abortion, from what we do in our own bed rooms, who we love, who we marry, and whether and when we have children, and more. And in finding that we have no constitutional right to be free of state control in the most private and personal aspects of our lives, the Supreme Court has opened a terrible Pandora's box with grave implications. And nowhere are those implications more grave than in the state of Idaho, where our GOP supermajority has already acted to strip women of their right to safe and legal abortion, uh, effective 30 days from now. But we have seen that their appetite for control of our private lives is boundless, going so far as to force women to undergo transvaginal ultrasounds and, as noted, allowing rapists to sue when a rape victim seeks an abortion. They have shown they want to control what medical care patients can provide their, or parents can provide their children, what books kids can read. Um, and at least one GOP leader has already expressed interest in poten potentially banning IUDs and other forms of birth control. And the Supreme Court today turned these control mongers loose. If Idahoans value freedom from government domination of their private lives, the need to elect more Democrats to the State House has never been greater. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, the GOP politicians in this building thump their chests nonstop about, quote, saving babies through these abortion bans. Their rhetoric is starkly at odds with reality and wish with their own actions. While bans on abortion might send a strong message to women that their autonomy is not valued by their state legislature, and they certainly inflict cost and difficulty on low-income women, there, these bans are actually a stunningly ineffective way to actually reduce abortion. The facts show that abortion rates are actually higher in places where abortion is restricted than in places where they are not, because the vast majority of women who want abortions will find a way to get them, whether by leaving the state and going to a jurisdiction where it's legal, or we hope not, but inevitably we know this does happen by pursuing illegal and unsafe means. Um, but abortion rates, ironically, are lowest in places where they're perfectly legal, uh, but where where services are provided, where there's access to contraception, where there's access to informative and accurate sex education, uh, yes. where, where there are policies in place, where women have livable wages, paid family leave, affordable childcare. Um, 
The truly effective way to reduce abortions is not to commandeer women's bodies, but rather to improve access to contraception, improve access to sex education, and make motherhood financially feasible. Yeah. Through yeah. <laughs> Ironically, ironically, those are all things that our GOP supermajority has fought tooth and nail for years. So voters, don't be fooled. The GOP legislators who have brought bill after bill to force women through pregnancy against their wills have done nothing to genuinely reduce abortions. Their actions have, if anything, likely increased them. For seven years, they blocked Medicaid expansion, which would have provided free contraception to the lowest income women in the state. Just by doing that alone, they undoubtedly substantially increased the number of abortions in Idaho. This session, they blocked access to six months of contraception, making it more difficult for women to access contraception. Now they're talking about maybe by banning IUDs. They killed, uh, let's see, they brought bill after bill to make it harder for high schoolers to access sex education by trying to make it an opt-in system. They rejected $18 million in funding for pre-K that would have made motherhood a whole lot easier on people. Uh, <laughs> The majority of House GOP legislators rejected funding for affordable housing. They rejected funding for affordable child care. Uh, year after year, they've refused to even consider paid family leave or raising the minimum wage. Um, they have basically undermined absolutely every effort that would genuinely reduce unwanted pregnancy or make motherhood more economically feasible for the women of Idaho. They are only interested in one thing and one thing only, and that is government bans to force women through unwanted pregnancy, and that is not the answer. So in short, I am so tired of this hollow baloney about how they're, quote, saving babies, because the pushers of these bans have opposed every truly pro-child, pro-family policy that's come down the pike that would actually help families and actually reduce abortions. <laughs> All these bans are really about is returning to some mythical 1950s wonderland where women are second-class citizens who can't direct their own lives and bodies. And I'm not going to send my daughter to live her life in an episode of Mad Men. <laughs> I am going to do everything in my power to reverse these bans and implement policies that genuinely support families and genuinely reduce unwanted pregnancies. And if you agree, this is the time to act. Get involved in our elections. Elect Democrats. If you can find one, elect a Republican who's willing to stand for our rights, but I haven't found one yet. But if you can find one, support them. Uh, but meanwhile, uh, please elect Democrats who support women's freedom and autonomy and who support the policies that will actually help women and families. Um, this is our time. This is an election year. This is a powerful year where you have a chance to change every single seat in this building. Every single seat in this building is on the block this year. And your involvement can change the outcome. Uh, and please, please do not despair. They are hoping we despair. That's when we lose is when we despair. Today is not the end of the story. What was done today can be undone. We can undo these bans. We can undo these bans at the state level. We can pass federal protections. We can elect new people to the U.S. Senate. We can someday get new people on the Supreme Court who will value and stand up for our fundamental rights. So please do not step back, step forward, triple, quadruple your engagement from whatever it's been to, to date, because this can be fixed and it must be fixed. It is our duty to fight for our rights and it is our duty to win. Yes. With that. <laughs> and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the great Senator Melissa Wintrow. I don't know how I can follow that and I'll probably go off script. Some of you have already talked to me this morning and asked my reactions. You know, between the frustration and the anger, there's a lot of shame. I feel very ashamed. I, I think back on March 15th of this year in the legislative session and I remember feeling very ashamed of my colleagues on the Senate floor because they were actually erasing all the language from Roe v. Wade that we enacted in 1973 had not been touched since then. 
And that language protected women, protected people who are pregnant, and, and protected their freedom and privacy to their own bodies and their decisions. Yeah. And most importantly, it respected the rights of people who had been victimized by rape and sexual assault and incest. And while I watched my colleagues brush away as if nothing to see here, this outdated language is what they called it, I said to them it was more than ink on paper and more than crossed out lines. Yes. It was crossing out my very human rights. Yes. I was very mournful that day because as I stood there, actually before I was pulled from the Senate floor by an objection for the truth, I was mournful. It was a historic day that day because I knew they were preparing for today. This day has been plotted by out of touch GOP politicians for decades. And we have to respond. Yes. And some of you know I have worked decades in the anti-violence movement and with victims of sexual and domestic violence and sexual assault. And to watch my colleagues discuss ideology in the sterile environment of a Senate chamber with disregard of human complexity and choices and the trauma that people experience, I was shamed. Yeah. But from that shame, we will rise. And as my colleagues have said, we have a duty to fight. Yes. 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 Wow. As I said that day on the Senate floor, in tears, full of emotion, we will run this race. We will not relent. We never have. I see people here who have been working in this movement and have fought for my very rights. And we will have you now. Yes. What I love about the, the room today is the variety of ages. I see students. I see early 30s, I see middle-aged, <laughs> folks who are aging, <laughs> my hair is gray, but that's how we win. We must work together intergenerationally and show people that it is not with, it is, we are going to do this together. Yes. Now. Yes. Just as you have gone through a variety of emotions today. From tears, to anger, to frustration, to shame. We have to grab onto that and fight like hell, like we have never fought before. And the way to do that, the only way I see in this state to change the policy, we have to change the politicians in the seat. This state house. <laughs> The most troubling thing I heard on the Senate floor that day when they were removing the sacred language from Roe v. Wade was that it was outdated. I will tell you what is outdated. Your thoughts, your control, and your subversive acts against my freedom. That is what is outdated, and we must go. That is outdated. Now, what we... I want to end on this note because it's a pretty serious note. We have seen extremism infiltrate our state. We are seeing extremism and hate infiltrate our state. This is not the Idaho I came to in the 90s. This is not the Idaho now. We will push back. We will not accept it. Yeah. yeah. Now, the problem with that extreme and what I have seen over and over is that the extremists are pulling my establishment friends into the melee and they are resigning to the fact yep. 
of trying to keep their job instead of doing their job. Yeah. It is time to elect Democratic leaders who have been listening, who have been fighting for property tax relief, fighting for our schools, fighting for our bodily autonomy, fighting for everyday Idahoans. That is the way to change, and that is what we must do. So I implore you, everyone who is listening, vote because your life does depend on it. I have never been more serious. We should probably end there, but I did want to, I did get a text from the mayor. And uh, we know that uh, she is a staunch supporter. So I, I wanna read just a brief statement from her. Um, she's at a college graduation actually, and so she can't be here today. So this is what she said. The news from home is unsurprising, but no less devastating. My heart is unspeakably heavy as I type this in the wake of this decision and as hundreds and thousands of Idahoans lose access to basic bodily autonomy and essential health care. It will be more important now than ever to stand strong for every last one of us. I remain steadfast in my support for all people who need access to abortion care and their right to privacy and health care decisions. Upon returning home, I will have more to share about Boise's role in this fight. But for now, I stand in solidarity with the brave women and leaders in front of you today. Thank you, Mayor McClellan. Well, it's, it's a really mixed day, obviously um, beyond disappointed in the news today, uh, really heartbreaking. I have a grandmother who is my idol who spent her whole life marching and fighting for women's rights. And uh, she passed away a year ago and I'm almost relieved that she wasn't here to see her life's work undone today. Um, but that said, uh, there was certainly more than a kernel of encouragement in the incredible showing today of all of the, the folks coming out who are devastated by this opinion and who are ready to work to undo the damage. So it gave me hope that uh, going forward we can salvage some freedoms for women in this state. And I spoke with a young woman in the crowd before you spoke and she basically said there's nothing good about today but it's good to see I have support. When mm -hmm. you're standing out there and you know, you're giving your speech and you hear the applause from behind you what are you thinking? I think we all need to know we're not standing alone at a time like this. You know, it's a very overwhelming time. I think people can succumb to despair, and women, especially at a time like this, can really feel like they are living now in a country where they are second-class citizens. And I think it was very important to have that camaraderie and know that the fight is not over, that there are people who do not think you're second-class citizens and who are ready to work to restore you to your full place in this world. <laughs> so uh, I think that was really important to me to have all those people there. You had said that you don't buy the GOP narrative of they're saving babies. Could you elaborate on that? I thought that was a really interesting <laughs> I am so tired of all the chest thumping about how they want to, quote, save the babies by banning abortion every way they can think of. The facts are very clear that banning abortion is a worse than useless way to actually reduce abortions. The abortion rates are highest in the world where abortion is banned, and they are lowest in the world in the places where abortion is perfectly legal. So if what you really want to do is reduce abortions, the last thing you should be doing is banning abortion, because the reason for this is that the very same people who want to ban abortions are also the same people who are trying to block contraception, who are trying to block access to sex education, who are trying to obstruct everything that could possibly reduce unwanted pregnancies. They're also the same people who are trying to block affordable childcare, block affordable housing, block paid family leave, you know, block pre-K, block everything that would make motherhood financially feasible for people. The real way to reduce abortions is to provide people an economic path where they can choose to carry their pregnancy to term and frankly, to reduce unwanted pregnancy in the first place. And those are the things that our Republican supermajority has fought tooth and nail and tried to stop with every fiber of their beings. So these people who have done nothing but practically speaking, increase abortions in the state, to me, have no business going around shouting about how they're saving babies simply because they want to force women through unwanted pregnancies. There's a situation now where, you know, two plus two is four, where in, in the future, there's going to be women in our state that are unable to get an abortion and they're going to give birth to a child that they didn't plan for. Mm -hmm. As a lawmaker, when you consider, I guess, the Department of Health and Welfare and programs to kind of make up for what's going to be the result of this, 
I guess, where's your mind at in terms of crafting legislation and attacking the reality of this? Well, we're long overdue to attack the reality of this. Idaho has been ranked as one of the worst states in the country for women because of all these things, because we're one of only four states that have no pre-K, because we have no access to childcare, we have no access to affordable housing. Um, we have no support structure for people who want to have babies in this state. Um, and that has long been a problem, and we're long overdue to address it. Um, in terms of you know who will actually be having babies that wouldn't have before, I think it'll be a very minimal number. I think anybody with financial means is going to go to a state where it's legal. Um, so the impact really will be on those very, very poor women, those women on the margins of society who don't have the money to head to Oregon for a day or two, who can't take the day off work. And they are likely to seek unsafe and illegal means, frankly, to get an abortion. Um, but I think you know the actual reduction in abortions is going to be trivial, if any, and it's going to impact those very lowest income folks who are already having the biggest challenges in their lives. Um, we do a lousy job of helping them right now. I, I hope that maybe this, these terrible laws finally taking effect will be some impetus to helping those women. But we, we can't keep putting women in this terrible box where we say we're going to take away everything that would help you not get pregnant against your will. <laughs> we're going to take away your contraceptive access. We're going to make sure you don't get accurate sex education. So then once you get pregnant, we're going to make sure you don't have any housing. You don't have any help with child care. You don't have any livable, livable wages. We're just going to make you have that baby and then sayonara. Good luck to you. Um, that's really what the state strategy has been thus far, and it's not a viable strategy. I spoke with Senator Wintrow this morning about what's next. You know, today's not just about today. She says, you know, what are they going to go after next? Mm -hmm. about contraceptives. There's also a national conversation now using the same logic the Supreme Court had to come to this conclusion. You can strike down interracial marriage. You can yep. strike down same-sex protections. As a lawmaker who's in a position yeah. to, to do something about <laughs> it, I mean, what are you thinking right now about everything we just talked about? People should be afraid. Um, that fundamental right to privacy under the Ninth, Ninth and Fourteenth Amendments of the U.S. Constitution has been the bedrock for every single case that says the government can't get in your private business. That was the basis for striking off, as you said, ban striking down bans on interracial marriage and same-sex marriage and homosexuality and contraception and everything. It was this fundamental principle that you have a sphere of privacy in your own life, in your own personal life, on who you're with, what you do in your bedroom, what you do with your own internal body organs. They just said no such thing. The only rights you have are the rights that your state legislature decides to give you. And in Idaho, we know that is not very many rights, that we have a state legislature that has demonstrated a great eagerness to get in people's business at every possible level. Um, so I think people should be very afraid on all these counts. Um, it was kind of ironically hilarious, actually, in the Justice Thomas dissent, because he specifically, or not his concurrence, he specifically said, we should repeal the right to same-sex marriage, we should repeal the right to contraception, we should repeal all these rights, except for interracial marriage, because I'm in an interracial marriage, so that should be protected. But nobody else's rights should be protected. Uh, <laughs> but uh, that's, that's what we're looking at in terms of whatever help we're going to get from the Constitution at the Supreme Court. So I would just tell people, if your private life is going to be in the hands of your state legislator, you better make darn sure Sure, you have a state legislator elected who cares about protecting your personal rights uh, because most people in the state can't say that right now. Uh, well documented, you touched on it earlier. It's an uphill battle in the state of Idaho. Democrats pushing against the supermajority of the Republican Party that appears to be going further and further mm -hmm. to the right. There's a lot of different strategies you can consider, but I guess what is your approach heading into January to do something about all of this, knowing you have an uphill battle? We do have an uphill battle. Uh, well, we have an election coming up, so that's really the first thing on the agenda, is to do everything we can to get more people in these seats who will ca care about people's fundamental right to privacy and people's personal lives and who are willing to stand up for it. Because uh, those aren't necessarily the same thing. There are a lot of legislators who might say, well, secretly, I don't think we should be passing these laws to get in people's business, but I'm going to pass it because I think it'll help me win my primary. We need people with courage, people who will actually do what's right and actually vote the way their heart tells them to stand up for people's private rights. Um, I would encourage the public, you know, it's an election. You have a chance to vote on every single person in the legislature and frankly, every single statewide official. Vote for people that will protect your right to privacy. We are in a dangerous, dangerous place. Talk about trigger laws. Um, this is probably too long for your broadcast, but we, we have a trigger. We, have, we know we have these trigger laws on the books regarding abortion. What's been less talked about is we have a trigger law in our constitution on same-sex marriage. There is a ban on same-sex marriage in the Idaho constitution. The only reason it's not operative right now is because of the Supreme Court's Obergefell decision. They said today that they think maybe Obergefell should be struck down too because it also rests on the fundamental right of privacy. So basically, the day they strike down Obergefell, 
Thousands of same-sex couples in Idaho are going to wake up the next morning and find themselves not really married. That is a train wreck. Um, that is another disaster in the making that we need to get out ahead of. And frankly, I'd like to see us taking action now to remove that piece of our constitution um, so that we don't have a mushroom cloud waiting on the horizon for all of our same-sex couples in Idaho. The answer to the questions I have for you. Um, and more, I'm and, sure. Uh, that's great. I mean, you asked the question I was going to get to is, you know, what, what happens next? And, you know, Supreme Bans Court. on contraception. I mean, you heard Brent Breen. I mean, I think there's a lot. The Pandora's box here is very real. Um, they've already expressed potential interest in banning IUDs, the morning after pill. Um, I know there's an appetite out there potentially to go after IVF fertilization because IVF fertilization inevitably results in the creation of fertilized embryos, not all of which get implanted. Um, so I would not be surprised if we start seeing attempts to ban IVF, which for couples struggling with fertility is going to be a nightmare. Um, again, you know, our LGBTQ community has already gone through nightmares with all of the various wars on transgender kids in this state, but it will only get worse uh, with the knowledge that there is no backstop at the Supreme Court anymore. Just, just real briefly, uh, I know this is. Do you think there's a chance that this could get back before the Supreme Court at some point under, you know, some other state's law? I know that. There are those, even on the left, that felt that Roe v. Wade was bad legal reasoning that even Justice Ginsburg a few years back said something to the effect of, I, I can't remember the exact quote, that it was the right result but kind of reached in the wrong way. She felt like the reasoning that the Supreme Court used back in, in, in the 70s for, for Roe v. Wade was flawed, even yeah. though she felt they got to the wrong result, or the right result. Yeah. Do you think there's a chance, you know, with another case you know, because she felt it was based too much on, I forget which amendment, it was either the 9th or the 14th, and it should have been on the other. I can't remember the exact reasoning, because I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, do you think there's a chance that there could be another case where this could, could be seen before another Supreme Court? Because, yeah. like I said, there were even people on the left that thought they agreed with the result, but the Roe v. Wade was, was flawed reasoning when they reached their decision in the um, I think it will someday, not not with the court in its current composition, but when the composition of the Supreme Court changes to something that would maybe be friendly or to a recognition of fundamental rights, um, I think this issue will come back again, and and all of the other implication, all the other issues that are by implication drawn into that fundamental right of privacy. Um, I, for one, would very much like to see this recognized at a constitutional level. I do believe, you know, I I don't know what the ninth amendment means if not protecting this fundamental right to privacy. Uh, so just from a constitutional scholar point of view, I feel like they have just knocked out a piece of the constitution by refusing to give effect to the ninth and 14th amendments. Um, but I don't think that our fundamental right, I don't think that our right to marry who we want to marry and do what we want with our own bodies should be at the whim of a state legislature. I think that is something that is more fundamentally American that should be protected in our constitution and doesn't just go this way and that based on what a particular state legislature feels like doing. Um, so I certainly hope that day will come when that constitutional right is once again recognized by the highest court in the land.